Hello, hi, my name is Angelo Lopez. I am a Filipino American editorial cartoonist based in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I have the honor and pleasure today to speak to a wonderful editorial cartoonist from Virginia. His name is Clay Jones. And let me tell you a little bit about him first. Hi. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Clay started out in the Panolian in Batesville, Mississippi. He And since that time, he's been in the Daily Leader, the Mississippi Business Journal, the Honolulu Star Bulletin, and the Freelance Star in Vicksburg, Virginia. His cartoons have appeared in the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, the New York Times, and USA Today, and several other newspapers and news sites. He was a finalist for the 2019 Herblock Award, and he won the 2022 Robert F. Kennedy Award and the 2022 Sigma Delta Chi Award for his editorial cartoons. And he has three first place awards from the Mississippi Press Association. So thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. Thank you for having me. I have one correction, and that is I live oh. in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Um, oh, okay. Not Vicksburg. Yeah, Fredericksburg. Which is funny, though, because I had uh, the Vicksburg, Mississippi paper used to be a client of mine when I self-syndicated in that state. But oh. I moved here in 98 to work for the Freelance Star in Fredericksburg, Virginia, until I was laid off in 2012. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you for the correction. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> okay. And I just want to start out just by asking, who are your cartoonist heroes and heroines and how have they influenced you? Um. I think my very first one is probably your first one and probably everybody's. And that is Charles Schultz. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. When I was a little kid, I wanted to grow up and be Snoopy. You know, I didn't know that I couldn't grow up to become a beagle. But uh, <laughs> that, that was my very first influence. And I think I kind of moved up to Garfield a little bit later. But when I discovered Mad Magazine, everything just exploded for me. Uh mm -hmm. I, I am like a student of Don Martin, Jack Davis, and Sergio Aragonis. Uh, and especially, I got to say, Sergio, uh, there's just something, just a looseness of a style. Um, yeah. I think that affected me, the, the wackiness, the zaniness. Uh, I think Jack Davis was a guy, while he, I knew that he, he would illustrate like the, the movie satires and stuff, but he yeah. would always throw in his own stuff. And I think that kind of infected me a bit to throw in like Easter eggs into my cartoons, it's sometimes things that have nothing to do with, with the plot or what's going on. And I just love that kind of stuff. I used to copy Jack Davis's stuff, not trace it, just sit there and copy it when I was a kid, like 12 or 13 and do it with a yeah. pencil. And even like he would do these afros where there's like a gazillion little tiny circles. And <laughs> that, taught me, that taught me patience when you draw grass or crowd scenes uh yeah. you just got to turn some music on and go into a trance and do that kind of stuff so i i think mad magazine is probably my my greatest education to become a cartoonist and that's a cliche i am just like it doesn't make me special because i think every cartoonist would tell you that they were a fan of mad magazine and yeah yeah I, I think especially editorial cartoons I, I i don't know an editorial <laughs> cartoonist who wasn't influenced by mad i think you're right because mad was parody of politics along yeah. with movies and such but but it, it was, you know, like training for future political cartoonists. Yeah. And, and I dived into that stuff. Uh, I was I was watching the news when I was a kid. I, I really, but the weird thing is I didn't even read editorial cartoons until I, I decided to become one. So oh, okay. Yeah, okay. I, I, I opened yeah. a book when I, I lived in Georgia for a few years as a kid. And one day in Albany, Georgia, I went to a bookstore in the mall and I yeah. went, went to the comic book section and all the comics and stuff. And I opened a book of editorial cartoons and I thought, this stuff is boring. <laughs> I don't want to read this. <laughs> and I thought it was boring, you know, back when I was like 13 or 14 or something. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, with me, um, Doonesbury was, a, uh, you know, but, you know, it took me, a, I had to first, I had, in order to understand Doonesbury, I had to actually understand the news and stuff. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And stuff. When I started understanding the news, I began to, um, like editorial cartoons better and stuff. But you know who helped me a lot was VC Columns. I, I, you know, oh yeah, yeah. When I became a member, my my first convention, he began recommending all these old cartoonists to me that I and I started loving them and stuff. But, <laughs> That's Column, all right. Yeah, I saw him a couple years ago. Well, a few years ago, like 
uh, I think in 2019, I went to um, Dwayne Powell's uh, Celebration of Life, and a bunch of cartoonists went to that, and Colm lives oh. in the area. And I remember Colm, Steve Sack, and I went to get a uh, milkshakes yeah, uh, yeah. between the event and and a bar everybody was going to, and Steve was coming. And this might be too personal, so I won't look that up. But Steve really wanted milkshakes. <laughs> so we went and got some milkshakes at this great place, and we sat there, and Colm pretty much gave us a – because that's what he does, call him, start to give us a history lesson about a lot of cartoons and cartoonists that we were never aware of. And it was just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I think we we're sitting there for like an hour and a half talking about, you know, cartoon history. Yeah, so, yeah. He, he did the same guy. thing to me. Yeah, because mm -hmm. before him, I, I, did, I didn't know many of these cartoonists and stuff. He, yeah, if it wasn't for him, I think my cartoons will look a lot different because the cartoons he recommended to me started influencing the way I did my stuff. Yeah, he, he's a historian, and he's also just the kind of guy that, that would talk to people like me and you when we first show up to our first convention and it, and welcomes us. He, he's he's really giving with his time, and he's he's a historian of yeah. what we do. He's I don't mean this as an insult. He he has forgotten more than than I will ever know, you know, about <laughs> cartoon history and stuff like that. And yeah. uh, he he knows a lot. He 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 keeps a lot up there, you know, stuff like that. I, I forget where to put the toothpaste, you know, <laughs> but he, he knows a lot. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I okay. call him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. <laughs> well, I, I'm curious now. I asked this of all the cartoonists and stuff. How do you do your cartoons? Do you, do you have a special drawing program you use? And um, what's your process when you do it? I, um, I, I use Procreate on an iPad and I'm not one of those guys that says that since I started using going digital or this is what I use and you should use it too. Yeah. Uh, I think everybody should use what works best for them. In 2016, I, I, I started, I left paper. I, I was kind of getting tired of, of like erasing mostly. That was really yeah. it. And, and also just keeping originals. I'm one of those guys that doesn't really want originals at all. Oh. And so I moved to, I got a Service Pro after doing a whole bunch of research between Service Pro and, and iPad. I got the Service Pro and I started using Corel. And then in 2021, I think I moved to the iPad and I thought, what research was I looking at? Because the iPad blows the Service Pro away. So oh, okay. I, I used Procreate and um, on my iPad, you might've saw me in San Francisco Drawing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why yeah. I asked and stuff because yeah. I think on one of the days you 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 couldn't join us because you had to finish your cartoon, right? Yeah, I remember that. Uh, I, I'm pretty good at putting some things off for a while, and I think on that Sunday we had breakfast. Were you with it in the group that had breakfast up the up the big hill? Not Wait, not Sunday, Saturday. not Sunday. Okay. I think I think my last day was Saturday. Okay, but that was the only day that I could actually get a seat in the lobby of the hotel. Cause that one table was always taken and there was no desk in our hotel rooms and that, in, in oh. the train. But um, my process, I guess, go back to that is I, I try to have my idea for like, say Sunday. Now, when I wake up tomorrow, I want my idea to be written already to write at some point today. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't always work out. doesn't always happen. And, um, but I'd like to wake up, make my coffee. Coffee's a big process for me part of it yeah. and start i go through like 20 things i have to do in the morning between sharing cartoons on facebook saying who's posting my work online make sure nobody's stealing it or or if there's any emails i need to reply to and, and such and then about maybe after about 30 minutes to an hour after i wake up i can actually start cartooning and oh, i procrastinate okay. while i draw i mean things stop me throughout the entire thing i mean i letter i mean i rough everything out and then I take a little break to respond to some stuff, or whatever. Then I then I letter, and then I take another <laughs> break, and then and then I I draw some, take another break. So it might take me four to five hours to do a cartoon, and it might only really be two hour drawing time. Oh, my yeah. CNN cartoons usually because they're Friday afternoon, and I just want to get my day over with. I will not procrastinate as much, so those cartoons might be quicker. And because I remember uh, Fridays. Fridays when I when I draw it and it publishes Sunday and I think I spent two and a half hours on Fridays on, on this week's scene in curtain because I didn't procrastinate yeah. at all. Well, yeah. I wait so much time. I, I I'm just terrible about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I spend a lot of my time just reading and stuff, you know, just um because you, you have know, to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you know, for me, if if I don't I have to care and stuff about and have a strong opinion about this. I I have a hard time doing cartoons on subjects I don't really know much about and don't care about and stuff so exactly 
that 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 is the the one problem that can come from an editor sometimes when they do assign stuff. And the only editor that really assigns anything to me is CNN. And this isn't like a, a bash on them. It's, it's with every editor. Sometimes you will be assigned something. You're just like, I don't really care about that at all. Let me yeah. try to care. Let me go read more about it or find a way that I can care about it. And like you said, I have to research a lot. I, I have to read and, you know, everything. You read everything. I, my TV is on. My, my TV is on CNN right now. Uh, muted. Oh, I mean, okay. My, I'm always on the news. I, I always have it on. On weekends or sometimes in the evening, I might take a little break and watch something else that's not news or watch some sports yeah, or yeah. something. But uh, I try to know what I'm talking about when I draw something. Readers will yell something at me or people who don't like my work. And I find out that half the time I, I can at least respond because I, I know about the yeah, issue. Uh, yeah. Um, and that's of course, right when, when they yell at you about something, they don't know what they're talking about. So that's fine. <laughs> I mean, they, they watch Fox News and they think they know it all, you know? So Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the same thing with me. If I, you know, I, I know if I do a cartoon, if somebody disagrees with me, I want to be able to defend myself. And so, right. Yeah. Uh, you have to understand also the difference between a troll who you don't have to respond to, and and I respond to them way too much. I feed them too much. But uh, if there's a legitimate conversation, I like to know what I am talking about and yeah. to be able to respond. I like to reply to something intelligent or at least uh, when I feel like I need to. I don't like to blow things off or or, or I, I don't want to run from a challenge but at the same time i don't want to spend all day arguing with the troll yeah so, you got to pick your fights yeah you do have to pick the fights and sometimes they're not fights you just i just want to talk about it you know people want to talk to me about it it doesn't have to be a fight in a long time ago like before 2016 it wasn't always a fight if you disagreed with somebody you were able to talk about it remember when we used to go to our conventions and we were able to do that we yeah, used to talk yeah, to yeah. cartoonists yeah. who the side of the aisle and you didn't fight them you would argue and stuff but you'd have a drink with them uh or you know and, and you were still friends i i know like ramirez back in the day ramirez and uh horsey were like two guys who were really really good friends but uh they, they didn't agree on anything yeah so yeah. But, but it wasn't a factor that if yeah. you didn't agree with somebody i, I noticed that change too i i'm 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 fairly liberal but i used to have close conservative friends and we used to be able to talk <laughs> about to. politics <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I used to be able to talk politics with them without it becoming um, personal, I guess, and stuff. Mm -hmm. But that changed and stuff. And that made me it sad be. because I they were to... close friends and stuff, you know. So I used to be friends with both McCoys. And mm -hmm. something after Trump came out, it was just like this, this fucking, sorry for the language, this mask comes off. It's like, ah, and uh -huh. you can't even talk yeah. to him anymore. It's like, ah, I didn't realize you were a Nazi. You know, <laughs> like I knew this guy for 20 years. And it's not just cartoonists. There's people in my my daily life, like a, a guy that used to I used to play guitar with, uh, work in a guitar store, and I thought, oh, he's a nice guy. And everybody talked to him about politics. And as soon as Trump came up, the guy started scoo stepping. And I'm like, when did this happen? When did, when did all these people that I used that I used to know somehow just overnight, including people in my family, just turn around and start drinking the Kool Aid, the orange Kool Aid? Yeah, yeah. It's really amazing. And they yeah. don't, and they're like your typical Trumpers. They don't know anything except for what Trump tells them. Trump never lies, you know? Yeah. Uh, the, the weaponize the OJ and build a wall <laughs> and blah, 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 you know? So, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm going to go off on a rant. Sorry. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I think a lot of us have gone through similar things. You know, you, you don't, you don't choose your friends based on political affiliations. A lot of times you just learn about it later on and stuff, right? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, and so you get to know them as a person and stuff. So for me, it was sad because I, it was painful for me to lose some of those friendships and stuff. Same here. And, and now I do kind of use it. Um, like I had a, um, I was drawing cartoons for an expat newspaper in Costa Rica. And I started drawing for them, I think in 2015. And after about a month into the job, I was doing a, like a, a, a little Zoom conference with the, the owner of the publication. And I made a joke about Trump and he goes, oh, Trump's awesome. He's great. And, uh, and and he was he was a Canadian actually, and oh. he's a Costa Rican. But he's down there just praising Trump. Like you guys are gonna be great. Anybody who 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 becomes a billionaire deserves to be handed anything he wants. And I was like, this is not gonna work out. But I kept working for him. And then they started arguing with me about oh. stuff. And then eventually, I they when we stopped the relationship, they they still owe me twenty five hundred dollars for cartoons I did for them. And oh. the lesson <laughs> is, don't get into any sort of business or personal relationship with a Trumper. Uh, it's my personal rule now. If somebody's no. a Trumper, I don't really want to do anything with them because they have the same ethics as Donald Trump. 
Donald Trump has zero ethics. He has zero personal ethics, zero business ethics. And if you get with somebody who's okay with Donald Trump doing that, then they're probably okay with screwing you over. So I, I, so now this thing that you're talking about, you never use politics to pick your friends. Now I kind of do, you know, I don't want to go out. I don't want to date a girl who, who likes Donald Trump. No, just not at all. Just can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't trust her. Yeah. I mean, I don't trust yeah, anybody. Not, yeah. Yeah. I, I just, um, you know, I, I, I had some, I mean, this kind of actually leads to my next question and stuff because right. you're, you're in Virginia and stuff and is, is Virginia purple? It's purple. We okay. have a Republican governor right now because, uh, unfortunately, voters are, are morons. Um, they, they totally forgot what Donald Trump was. And, and our, our uh, elections are off years, like after the presidential election. The next year we elect governors yeah. and we have like general assembly. That's a legislature every two years. Yeah. And right now it's controlled by Democrats. We have a Republican governor. And during his whole campaign, he lied about. Uh, Biden sending the FBI to harass teachers and, and stuff. Oh, and yeah, yeah. voters bought into it. And and the Democrats didn't put up a good candidate either, who was actually a former governor. But uh, we are very purple, but we lean blue. Uh, Biden won by a landslide in this state. We went blue with Obama uh, in 2008. Yeah. And I mean, we're still purple. And then the next year we got a Republican governor. And then after that, it was all Democrats until last yeah. year. And uh, Youngkin is just a horrible, vile person, but with a smile. So um, yeah, yeah. he's rancid. So, but our state is mostly blue. But but the blue areas, like where you were born, Norfolk and um, Northern Virginia, and my little town, Fredericksburg, we're like an hour south of Washington. But the, the city I live in has not elected a Republican since like 1988. And oh, okay. <laughs> totally blue. But we are surrounded by red counties. So it's not like I go. I can go to a bar or a restaurant and just talk to to liberals. Like you will have like a, a MAGA guy sitting right next to you in a bar or something like that. So I don't go out talking about politics if I can. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what are issues facing Virginia right? You know, the past few years. Um... Uh, the education thing was one thing that everybody was talking about. You know, it's it's like just like with national. We're we're probably a good representation of what's going on nationally. Okay. Um, like when Youngkin uh, was elected, he wouldn't talk about abortion. And then with the last election, that was this, last year, 23, for the General Assembly, they were like, trust us on abortion. We're not going to ban, ban abortion in the state. We just want a six-week restriction. And voters wised up because they were like, well, they're Republicans, so that means they're lying. Uh, yeah. As soon as they, they get control, they're going to ban it. And so they lost. Uh, yeah. And then they blamed you know, Democrats for lying about their, their position. But they were lying. They were going to ban abortion as soon as they got it. They, they lied about critical race theory. Like, when I'm elected governor, we'll get rid of critical race theory out of all the schools, which is not in any of the schools, because that's yeah, what yeah. Republicans do. They effing lie. How much is my language? Uh, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know what kind of age group you have here. But um, I talk about politics and Republicans. I tend to curse, but um, I'm lying. I curse about everything. But, uh, <laughs> but it's Republicans. a part of being in a purple state you get exposed to that more than I do as a person in California. Yeah, you, you don't have as many presidential can, candidates campaigning there. Here, you know, I don't think Trump worried about Virginia last time because he, I think he knew it was gone. Uh, he oh, did come okay. here in 2016. I actually went to his rally. He came here in town, and um, that was scary. Yeah. Uh, I took a very good friend with me. He, she was uh, the letters editor at my last job, and her name was Hillary. And yeah. she is Jewish. And so when we got there, she's like, don't tell people my name's Hillary, because I know these, these Trumpers are immature enough to like just come after me just for that. And don't tell them I'm Jewish. <laughs> and I'm uh, like, all right, we just won't do that, you know, if it comes up. But I'm not going to walk through the rally going, look, I'm with a uh, Jew named Hillary, <laughs> you know? But yeah, Hillary's yeah. one of my best friends. And yeah, so, so yeah. but yeah, Virginia, we, we, we're in a bit of a, of a battleground, but I don't think we're a real battleground. I think. Uh, I think we're a battleground for uh, like senators and governor, but I think pre for president, we're, we're knock on wood or my glass drawing table. Uh, I, I think we're pretty much a, a, a good lock for the Democrats for the presidential race. Uh, okay. We do have two Democratic senators. And oh, okay, good. Governor. So that's how okay. we're, we are. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Well, you know, you're a well traveled editorial cartoonist. You've worked in newspapers in Mississippi. 
Hawaii and Virginia, right? Yeah. What did you learn from your experience in working in these very different states? Mississippi is like a, Marshall Ramsey would tell you this, he got there right before I left, um, and, and he worked at the Clarion Ledger for a long time, but he would tell you Mississippi is like the world's biggest small town. Everybody, like in politics and such, especially in the journalism community at newspapers knows everybody that the journalism community is kind of tight knit. You go every paper since representatives and such to the conventions and they're, and they're fun. Yeah. Uh, so it's kind of like a small town. The funny thing about Mississippi is that your casual voter person on the street would know who the agricultural commissioner is. They know who the lieutenant governor is. They know the, the attorney general, the, the, all these people, the secretary of state, they all make a lot of noise. Uh, in Virginia, People don't. People really only know who the governor is. Maybe uh, they're not. Mm. Not as mu much like a small town. We're a larger, larger state. Um, so, uh, and and like in Mississippi, I remember the governor came to my newspaper one day, and he came to my office, and he's going through the cartoons. And then another day, that uh, <laughs> Mike Moore, who started that the whole tobacco lawsuit in the nineties, <laughs> he came to my office, and he's going through stuff and. And then I, I went to a Little League game with the governor and his staff and some other reporters just because you know, he's doing a photo op. So I went there with them. I was, when you work for a small newspaper in Mississippi, you do a lot more than cartoons. I was like a photographer and delivered yeah, yeah, paper yeah, yeah. To, to the stores and such. Um, but anyway, like at the ball game, I'm trading photos, show my, showing him photos of my kid. He showed me photos of his daughter who was about the same age. This is before iPhones. We actually had real photos. Um, yeah. And then like a week later, if I talked to a journalist at another newspaper, I said, hey, um, uh, the governor was in my office the other day and he'd be like, okay, so what you don't, you don't impress people with that because oh. it's a small state, you know, people run into him. The population's small. Yeah. Uh, I think it's six or seven electoral votes. Uh, in Hawaii, <laughs> Hawaii's mean, uh, yeah. at least in the nineties, Hawaii's for me, the journalism was so much more fierce because we were at war with the other newspaper. Um, and, and why is just there for a year to take it over for Corky? Who I know you want to talk about. Yeah. But we were in the same building and but there was magazines, there was the alt week weekly, there there was other newspapers, and a lot of people would gather at the bar next door and you'd run into other journalists and stuff, and yeah. you'd have debates and arguments. Politicians would come to your office, like from the city council to the state legislature, they'd come to your office to try to impress you, try to win you over. And after my my time in Mississippi, I was there for like seven years. I was sick of meeting politicians. I was just tired of all these guys. Because all, all they do is kiss your ass. So my first week in Honolulu, if you yeah. like the stories, um, the governor, Benjamin Cayetano, he, uh, Filipino, he um, yeah. invited the editorial staff, it's like five or six of us, to come to the to the governor's office. And I didn't go. And they said, and they did, my paper bosses weren't going to meet me, and I was new. They said, oh, you don't want to go? You don't want to go meet the governor? I says, no, I really don't. I don't really want to meet these people because I don't need to, for the most yeah. part. I, I just don't think I have to meet them at all. And yeah. then the next day, I didn't go to the meeting. Then the next day, his wife comes into my office with her daughter, who is like maybe two or three. <laughs> and she comes in there. And this woman was in an Elvis movie when she was three. Her Vicky Cayetano comes to my office. And she's like, Clay Jones, why weren't you in the meeting yesterday? Why didn't you come visit us? And stuff. And I'm just, and I'm drawing, and I'm just like, duh. I'm, I'm like 29, and which is to me now a baby. But I'm just like, duh, duh, duh. The other thing was, was that she was like drop dead gorgeous. So I was also like, duh. <laughs> First person I ever saw him that made a moo moo look good, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, she was just amazingly beautiful, but also funny and huge charisma. And then, but it didn't work. I still spent the rest of the year making fun of her husband and drawing yeah, 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 and stuff like that. But that's how Hawaii was different. Hawaii, I would get phone calls. You from know, counselors. I'm surprised. I, I I had this idea that Hawaii would be mellow, but it's actually pretty fierce and stuff. The people are mellow. The people are the nicest people you will ever meet in the world. But the politics is mean. And the funny thing is, like when Mississippi, when I was there in the '90s, it, it was just transitioning to becoming a Republican state. It was still all Democrat, but oh, the Democrats, okay. were all, the Democrats were all conservative. And uh, Hawaii was also run by Democrats, except they had a total lock on it. Your Republicans in Hawaii were more liberal than the Democrats in Mississippi. Um, yeah, yeah. So, but the, the bad thing about it totally being run by Democrats in Hawaii is that there's so much corruption. 
because all the Democrats were supported by the unions. The unions are huge in Hawaii. And yeah. then, of course, those Democrats would appoint judges. If you want to sue the union, you got to go through the judges that were basically appointed by the unions. Uh, yeah. there, there was just yeah. a lot of corruption in Hawaii at that time. I haven't been there since, but I had a blast working in Hawaii. <laughs> that was the most fun I ever had in my life. But the other thing, though, was that um, it, one of the biggest scandals in in Hawaiian history what happened while I was out there, and that was with uh, the Bishop Estates. Uh, there was a lot of corruption in graft going from that with the, the trustees um, abusing, you know, their power and the funding and stuff. And the Bishop Estates it is like a, a school that's that was a trust built from a Hawaiian princess and uh -huh. uh, for Hawaiian children, and and they were abusing it. And then uh, a priest and so many other people, officials. Uh, wrote an editorial that ran in my newspaper, yeah. and uh, I I got to I got to be the first cartoonist to hit on it. The other cartoonists didn't even know about it before I hit on it because it, it was like breaking news and in my yeah. paper. Um, and so I spent like that was the biggest issue for the rest of my year when I was out there, and and I just had a blast doing that. I hated to leave Hawaii. I was like I don't want to, I didn't want to leave at all. But but unfortunately, Corky wanted his job back, so I had to leave. Yeah, you know, I I wanted to ask about that too, uh, but you know, with um, because I'm a Filipino American cartoonist, and Corky, I, I I didn't really know any other Filipino American political cartoonist, but Corky Trinidad was a Filipino American editorial cartoonist. What was it like being with him? Um, Corky, as you probably know, but I'll tell you for readers, he he was from the Philippines and he worked for a, a Filipino paper. Uh, and he was chased out by Marcos. So this guy was a warrior. This guy was a hero to me. Um, I mean, he, he took a stand uh, against the corruption and a, and a dictator, basically, and was yeah. chased out of the country. A dictator let him come back once while he was in power. That was to go to go to his mother's funeral. But Corky yeah. went to Hawaii, got a job at the Star Bulletin. I, I'm not familiar with all the history of it. I know yeah. that he worked for USA Today and he worked for uh, Military Times or something, Army Times or whatever. Yeah. But and he did a comic strip and not that familiar with. But I I didn't get to meet Corky that much. Didn't get to know him. When I first got there, oh. and they gave me his office. He was gone. They, he was leaving for a year on a sabbatical, and he was pursuing this uh, comic strip venture with Asian newspapers. And oh, they okay. and my boss, boss told me, and boss says, he all said, Corky's probably not going to come back. This might be your job if you do it well. And within a week, they were like, they were like, you're doing it well. This will be your job if Corky decides to come back. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was like, this is awesome. And the staffers like me. I like them. I like the, I, lo I love the paper. I, I love the people. Yeah. And, uh, but then Corky had to come back uh, for a couple of weeks for some insurance thing. And they said, well, you can't be a cartoonist, but you can um, work in the graphics department for a few weeks. And uh -huh. so I talked to him a couple of times and I didn't really get to know him. There was just like some sort of wall between us. He didn't bother me. He, he wasn't rude nothing like that. And then, and then I, I saw the comics feature that he was trying to do. And when I saw it, I thought, actually, Corky showed it to me. He, he said, this is what I'm going to do in Asia. And when I saw it, I was like, yeah, that's great. And I pat him on the back. And I thought in my head, I'm not going to get to keep this job because this isn't going to take off. This is this is horrible. This thing that he's putting together, all the other comic strips are not good. They weren't his comic strips. But he was doing like three or four because he, he needed to fill all the spaces. And yeah. since he was like cramming them out, they weren't very good either. But the other people that he recruited, they weren't very good. And I, I know bless his heart and all that stuff. I don't mean to trash them. Uh, so I knew I wasn't going to get to keep that job. I knew Corey would want it. And then a few weeks before I left, Dick Adair, who worked at the other, at the paper across the hall, the editorial cartoonist, he came into my office, which surprised me because we weren't supposed to go into each other's buildings. And, but somehow he, he weaseled in and, um, he said, Hey, I'm having a party at my house this weekend. Found out he was actually living in my neighborhood. Didn't know it. He had a house, a home on this canal in Hawaii Kai, this neighborhood. And he said, Corky, but we're having a party to welcome Corky back. That's cool. But we did figured, hey, we're making a party to say goodbye to you too and uh, celebrate <laughs> your year. I said, yeah, it sounds great. I love going to a party full of cartoonists and stuff. And yeah, yeah. Uh, and I hadn't really met Adair at all. And I did, hadn't gotten to know Corky. But when I went to the party, Corky brought me a book of his work. And I got to know him just from this one party. And I fell in love with the guy. Uh, mm -hmm. He's such a huge personality, huge charisma. His wife was great. Uh, I got to know Dick. Uh, totally had the wrong impression of him. The entire year, I'm thinking I, I'm kicking this guy's butt. He he hates me. My my cartoons are funny and and they're hard hitting and 
and and I know he's reading me every day, and he's probably like, this guy. But when I got there, I just I realized he didn't care. He didn't care what I was doing. <laughs> he wasn't threatened by me. But um, Corky was was super cool. I talked to him a few times after I left, and when when he was sick, I I I, I wrote to him a few times. But he was a big sweetheart. Uh, he was he was lovable. I got I heard this one story about Corky from my editor. And they love Corky. And that was the one thing when they they were like, yeah, we love your work. We love keeping you. But I also knew at the same time that they love Corky, too. They weren't like, we, yeah. we want to get rid of that guy. It was nothing, none of that. They love Corky. Um, yeah. I only heard from one person who's, who was like, oh, they need to keep you and just get rid of Corky. Only one guy on the staff said that. Uh, but everybody else was like, we love you. You're great. But we also love Corky. Yeah. And I proposed to the publisher, you should just keep both of us, you know, because you had to do two cartoons a day, front page, editorial page. And it was a lot of work. And I said, you should let me and Corky alternate. But they were like, hey, this is when you get <laughs> But um, I, I heard the story that there was an editorial board meeting and they were writing about this issue about the, the state giving free condoms to students. And Corky stood up and goes, no, 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 we can't give free condoms to students. And they're like, why not? He says, nobody should get free condoms until I get free condoms. <laughs> so <laughs> like, I want free condoms. <laughs> But he was just a funny guy, you know, just always, you know, he, he was hilarious. I, I loved him and I didn't even get to know him that well, but yeah. I spent a lot of time with him. You know, I think he respected uh, when I was there not to bother me, you know, yeah. when I, even when he was in the building, I don't think he, I think he might've come in my office his first day when he's just back for a couple of weeks just to say hello, but he yeah. didn't come back in again. He, he didn't, he didn't come up. He didn't talk about my cartoons. He, he never came in and graded them or said, Hey, great cartoon or Hey, I don't know about that. He, he yeah. never did any of that. Um, I, I think he just kind of kept his distance. And it was kind of funny because at that time, I was always going to the graphic artist's office. They had this huge office and they had a lot of toys. And there's like three or four people in there and a TV. Yeah. And I'd go hang out in there and it just, just to like relax or, or goof off or whatever. And yeah. uh, and I don't even remember getting to know Corky while I was doing that during that oh, time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but anyway, he, he was a great guy. He... I remember seeing like some letters from some wannabe cartoonists who were Filipino. And after I got the job and they were just like, I want to work at Corky's desk. It'd be such an honor. And stuff like that. Hey, <laughs> well, I would feel the same way. I would feel the same way. Maybe that was your letter. I don't know. <laughs> oh, what? Yeah. Maybe yeah. that was your letter. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I, would, I, would, I envy thought. you for that and stuff because like, I don't, I don't know the history of Filipino American editorial cartoonists. And when I just, and when I looked at your bio and found out that you you worked with Corky, you know, I thought, oh my gosh, <laughs> I wanted to ask you about that just because um, I just, I just don't know and stuff, you know. Yeah, Corky's a hero. Uh, that's the way I view him. I mean, anybody, I mean, you got some serious chops, some ser serious street cred with as an editorial cartoonist if you were chased out of your country by a dictator, you yeah. know, and you kept drawing against him. You know, he he did like shoe cartoons about shoes, you know, <laughs> from Imelda yeah. and stuff like that. And that's why I like I think about, you know, uh, like Pedro Molina, who was chased out by a dictator. Yeah, know, yeah, I met him. Cover. I met him. I, I... You have? I, yeah, I, I want to meet him. I, I've corresponded with him like through Twitter and stuff. And I think he's a hero. I think these guys are yeah. champions of what we do. Of course, free yeah, speech. He has a lot of courage. And stuff. Yeah. And that's what pisses me off about the guy in Canada. who's working under an anonymous name. Uh, well, I don't know this. What are you talking about? Oh, Daryl Cagle syndicating a guy. He lives in Canada and he does a bunch of right wing cartoons about, you know, all, all, on U.S. issues, giving the impression that he lives here. But he's working anonymously, not a pen name, but he oh. works anonymously. And a lot of people don't know that he's anonymous. And some that do, they just don't really care because it's like, ah, it's just a cartoonist. They don't need it to have the have to go by journalism ethics, even though we're supposed to. So yeah. Daryl Cagle syndicating an anonymous cartoonist. And I think about people like Corky or Pedro who had to, like flee for their lives. But who's going to chase this guy down in Canada who, yeah. who's spreading like right wing conspiracy theories? Nobody's going to go gunning for him or crap like that. So yeah. that's yeah. the thing that annoys me because we actually have real heroes out there. People that yeah. could have yeah. like. You meet him in the Cartoons Rights Network International. And stuff, yeah, you know? and the thing is that Corky could he could have changed his name and try to hide. Though I think it would be hard for a cartoonist uh, to do that because it's hard to change your style. And yeah. like the guy in Canada, we know who he is because his style has not changed. But he just changed his name because he thinks he's smart or something. 
but uh, okay yeah, yeah. I, I don't know much about this so yeah i, I can't say much, name, yeah. i don't want to say his name i'll tell you i don't want to promote him anymore oh, no 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 don't his don't say it. i mean you know i, I don't want to um you know i don't want to <laughs> i'm not in the policy of outing anybody <laughs> no no i don't want to give you his fake name because i don't want to promote that oh, you know okay. either but i'm not going to out him because i think oddly enough i think if i outed him that would be very unethical for me Okay. I, I looked in your website and, and it states that when you started doing your cartoons, you were a moderate conservative, but yeah. over the years, you kind of evolved into becoming a more far left liberal. What, what causes change? Um, I think I was always pretty liberal. I didn't really realize it. I remember when I was in Hawaii, uh -huh. I told my editor, I made just some reference one day about being a conservative and she it's like, you're not a conservative. Get out of here. I'll read your cartoons. <laughs> and then another staffer did the same thing one day. He's like, conservative? You're not conservative. And I said, yeah, but I'm pro-life. And they're like, you're not really conservative. And I thought, but I'm for gay marriage. That's conservative. They're like, no, it's not. And I said, well, leaving people alone is conservative. <laughs> leave, if you let people love who they want to love and get married. You leave the government out of it. Isn't that conservative? Yeah. And the only thing that I really flipped on was abortion. Um, but the thing that really made me realize it was not conservative was um 9-11 uh yeah. and, and it wasn't just 9-11 it from that the patriot act and i opposed the patriot act because it pretty much was just giving the government a license to spy on everybody uh this in the constitution and i went to war with my newspaper about that said i don't want to support this uh -huh. and then the iraq war came up and i said i don't want to i can't support that I, there, there's no justification for it they're just using 9-11 for this invasion and then i started to realize along with the other issues that Gosh, Republicans, and I never consider myself a Republican, uh, yeah. and, I, and I'm not a Democrat now. I, I I don't believe if you're a journalist, and I'm not trying to be on a high horse by saying I'm a journalist. We're all journalists. Uh, yeah. If you work for newspapers, you should not be a member of a political party. I I strongly oppose that. Uh, a lot of uh -huh. cartoonists consider themselves members of political parties, especially Republicans. But I realize that Republicans are just so full of shit. And the thing is, I don't love Democrats, but Democrats seem to be supporting more of the rights of this country that we, we should have. Republicans yeah. are more re repressive, regressive. And over time, I just like decided to just be who I really am. And that is, I am a far left liberal. I am, and I don't expect people to be as liberal as I am, but yeah. like a lot of people think that they represent the majority of something. I, I know I don't do that. I, I know most of this country uh, supports democratic policies more so than Republican policies, but I don't expect people to be as liberal as I am. And I, and I started my niece one day and she was like, I don't know if I'm really comfortable calling myself a liberal. And a couple of years later, she's calling herself a liberal because liberal is such a bad word uh, yeah. or, or made yeah. into such a bad word. It's not. Every advancement in this country ha is because of liberals. You know, it's like when these idiots yell, but Democrats started were in the South. They were the slave owners. They started the Klan and stuff like that. Conservatives did all that. Yeah. You know, liberals were the ones that freed the slaves. Liberals are the ones that gave us the Constitution. Liberals are the ones that got rid of child labor. You know, liberals are the ones that, that gets the five day work week. Yeah. Um, liberals are the ones who, who, who get women the right to vote. Yeah. Conservatives opposed all that. I don't care what if it's already by their name it is always conservatives. Yeah. And the, the, the advancements in this country, I, I, I'm for civil rights, human rights. And this is why I want to win the RFK so bad, because that's the main thing that I want to go for is yeah. like civil rights for people. And, and fighting against racism and such. So that's pretty much how I, I advanced to just realizing that, that I am a liberal, you know? Yeah. Um, right, checking my desk. But, um, and <laughs> I, I pretty much oppose just about everything that, that is conservative. And that has to make me oppose the Republican Party. Yeah. I, I can't see myself ever voting for a Republican ever again. Yeah. I'm wondering if part of what, you, you know, you, you know, part of your thing is you value having an independent mind. Right. Yeah. That, yes. you know, being you. tied to a political party, you know, um, like, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly left, but I, I, you know, but I, 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 if I disagree, I, I, I feel I have a right to disagree. I, I'm, I don't feel like I should be tied down to like, if I ever disagree with the left, I should feel free to disagree with the left and stuff, even yeah, though I, I'm the left, you know. I totally agree with that. I mean, take Bob Menendez for an example. I don't want to have to make excuses for somebody that does that. You know, yeah. I don't have to make excuses for Hunter Biden. Uh, yeah. I, I, he's he looks like seems like he's been a vile person most of his life. But and I don't have to defend that. I yeah. I only defend not going after him as a private citizen. But 
So I don't want to tie myself to parties to to have to defend their BS. Uh, yeah. we, I, I am not partisan. I, I might be extremely liberal, but partisan is, is a party thing. I am not partisan. I don't yeah. care if you get a D next to your name if you mess up. And yeah. I will hit Democrats with my cartoons. Now, I, I have a readership that's, that's like 99% liberal, and they don't like those cartoons as much, but they let me get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that shows that you're willing to that show I, I admire that about you your independence of mind so it's like say like i had a, i had this talk with another cartoonist is like um you know george orwell he was to the left but he mm -hmm. was still willing to criticize stalin right yeah you know, um you know um barry goldwater was to the right he was still willing to criticize jerry falwell and stuff mm -hmm. right you know you don't have to be just because you're one side or the other, you should be able to still criticize your own side if, if you know, if they're doing something wrong. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say that I'm on the same side as Stalin, but you know, uh, there's a difference between the left and the leftist, I, I believe. Yeah, know? yeah. No, I, I just right it's an example and stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I understand that. I get yeah. It. Okay. Well, I, I'm curious. Um, I've had several talks with cartoonists, and there seems to be consensus that um, American editorial cartoonists no longer have the influence that Herb Block once had or Paul Conrad in terms of national issues, but American editorial cartoonists still have a lot of influence on local issues and state issues. But there's a conundrum in that, in that many local newspapers have been dying out and the ones that survive Many of those local newspapers that survive no longer have an editorial cartoonist. How how can do you have any opinions on how American editorial cartoonists can, um, uh, you know, solve that conundrum? I think that conundrum is um, as difficult to solve as it is trying to figure out how we continue to make money as an independent, unemployed cartoonist. It's very yeah. difficult. You're right. We don't have the influence uh, of a Conrad or a Herblock. Are, are a are an elephant uh we don't have that anymore nationally the, the, the best that i can hope now is to get blocked on twitter by donald trump jr or something like that uh <laughs> we just don't have it anymore yeah. we don't change people's minds we are mostly drawing for the choir i i love it when the other side screams at me i i just i love knowing that other people are reading my cartoons i got like three or four consistent haters on go comics and i'm glad they're there you know a lot of people say get rid of the trolls and some of them are trolls but i want to hear from other people um i'm not changing their minds though uh at, at all um and they're not changing ours either uh republican cartoonists aren't changing liberal minds at all you know ramirez isn't changing anybody's minds you know um trying to think of another conservative right now but um but they're not doing it uh yeah, Either but way, you know, the, yeah. yeah, I'm just thinking that when you're saying that you're you're a liberal cartoonist who's willing to criticize Democrats, so you're willing to keep your own side accountable. Is yeah. that a, that's a good? That's not that's to me. That I believe we like have to be thing. responsible. I I don't work for the Democratic Party. I don't work for a liberal party. I don't I don't work for the liberal agenda. I I'm not an activist. I, I I'm a one maybe a one person activist. I'm not joining any campaigns. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I, I do want to prevent Donald Trump getting in the White House, but I'm not going to go join a, a campaign about that. Uh, yeah. And how we change minds or influence. <laughs> I think you're right. There could be a lot of influence on, on local issues. I believe that because uh, you're, because Johnny, well, so Johnny Carson has some old stuff. Jimmy Kimmel is not commenting about your local alderman, you know, or, or your yeah. local tax policy and stuff like that. That really the only people that comment on that are columnists in newspapers or or online news outlets are the cartoonists. If there is a cartoonist, um, that is where you could probably have the, the most persuasion and maybe or at least the, the most impact. Even if you're not persuading people, you can make people talk about it, make people think about it. That is to me, the strongest thing that a political cartoonist can do is actually inform through satire is to educate people about the issues. Um, and I think you can do that more so locally, which is why I really miss drawing local cartoons. I got my job in Hawaii on the strength of my local cartoons. My my editor in Hawaii, Diane Chang, told me that when they were going through all the submissions and there were some high profile people applying for that job, people way more famous than I am. Um mm -hmm. And um, I don't want to say their names because I don't want, want to make it sound like I'm better than them because I'm not. <laughs> uh, but ha ha, I beat you. But um, 
But when they looked at my cartoons, because everybody was singing this stuff about Bill Clinton, this was 97. And uh, this is like a year before Monica Lewinsky stuff. But Bill Clinton, Newt Gingrich, and whatever else was going on that year. And um, I sent in stuff along with that too. But I also sent in a lot of Mississippi cartoons, a lot of local stuff. Oh, and they yeah, said yeah, that yeah. when they read my local cartoons in Mississippi, that they understood the issue uh, yeah. that I was talking about. And they were like, I never even heard of this Governor Fordyce. Kirk Fordyce, Mississippi, before, but I know what the cartoonist is talking about, and they yeah. hired me for that because they wanted me to really focus on local stuff. They didn't hire me to draw national cartoons, and, and I drew national cartoons, but they, the, the Star Bulletin wanted me to draw, and Corky did this for years, uh, to draw a daily cartoon uh, six days a week on the front page in full colors at the bottom of the page. Little did I know that they had Quirky doing it five days a week. So they tricked me into doing it an extra day. <laughs> they tell me that too after I had agreed. But, um, <laughs> but that's the power of local cartoons. And, you know, every time a reader wrote or, or called, and God, they called so much, councilmen called, city councilmen and stuff, and, and state legislators. Of course, they called about the local issues, the, the state issues, um, yeah. city issues. They didn't, nobody ever called me yelling about my Bill Clinton cartoon or my yeah. new finger. Uh they called about what I drew about Governor Cayetano at the time, or gotta remember this Marjorie Bronster, the, the attorney general in the state. Um, I think that's right. Or the the mayor at the time, his name's escaping me. And I, the mayor went to Waikiki one day to give a press conference that, that wasn't like overrun with rats. And while he's giving the press conference, a rat ran up his pants like every cartoon after that, he had a rat with him that I drew. And that is the strength of a local cartoon because after that, he couldn't get away from the stigma of the rat. You know, yeah. uh, I, I I could do that nationally and like draw flies around Donald Trump every time and, and my readers and stuff like that. But I, I'm not going to like get the, get the perception to the entire country that Trump is covered with flies just to my readers, you know. So the local cartoons are way more powerful. That's where the cartoonist can cut his teeth. If a cartoonist is not good at local issues, then he's not really, you don't know if he's a good cartoonist or not. We can all draw, you know, red yeah. wave cartoons and stuff like that we can out draw donald trump with with the, with the bad hair and the big lips and stuff and the tiny fingers but what, what can you do with your mayor what can you do on a local figure that nobody else can lead you on that nobody else can say oh you you drew this guy with big eyebrows so i'm gonna draw him with big eyebrows or big ears you yeah. gotta invent all that stuff if you're the local guy for the yeah. most part there might be another cartoonist maybe but and that's where you really do cut your teeth and I draw one local cartoon a month now for this local outlet. And I really miss being uh, a cartoonist. You can draw a lot of local stuff. I, that, that is one thing that yeah. I do. Yeah, I think one of the reasons that I'm asking, because I, I used to be in a Filipino-American community newspaper, but yeah, I, I, had to be, I had to be let go last March. And I kind of felt rudderless and stuff because I love mm. doing stuff for the Filipino-American community. But now that I'm no longer in that paper, I don't have the avenue to like um, to really comment because I don't know if anybody, you know, the community I want to reach, I don't know if I can reach anyone and stuff. So, I think you can. Yeah. I think you can. I, I think if you promote yourself enough and, and with the strength of social media, uh -huh. I believe you can. I, I think I have a, a larger audience today as an independent than I ever had at my newspaper, not because my newspaper didn't have reach, but because of the way social media has blown up since I left my paper. I believe you can do that, Angela, if you put your time and focus into it and build an audience on social media. It takes a oh, while. Okay. But okay. you yeah. know, this kind of leads to my next question. Actually, one of, actually not, not my next, but one of my questions is that you decided to self-syndicate in 2013, right? Mm -hmm. and yes. stuff. Is that part of the what led you to that decision? And um, what was what was that experience like? And so you, you, you kind of alluded to that when, when you said that you started uh, building an audience in social media. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what led to that is that I was with Creator Syndicate, and they're very good. Creators is great. I have nothing bad to say about them, but I wasn't making any money. I was making about 100 bucks a month from Creators. So that was just a little stiff end to my salary at the newspaper, and it was fine and all that. But when I lost my newspaper job, and I, I, I spent a year just not doing anything, collecting unemployment, looking for another job that I knew I wouldn't get and uh, drinking a lot and playing music and just yeah. moving off, really. And when it got down, serious when 2013 rolled around and then I thought, what am I going to do now? I need to be serious about this. And I've been thinking about it for a while, but yeah. I thought I want to make a living. I got a part time job for a few weeks and I hated it. 
And yeah. then I quit. I said, I really need to be a cartoonist and nothing but a cartoonist. And knock on wood, hopefully that's all I'll stay. Hopefully I don't have to get a real job down the road. But uh, that's, that's my nightmare. But I uh, thought I am not going to do it on 100 bucks a month from Creator Syndicate. So I need to syndicate myself. So I I found a clause in my contract that got me out. Creators didn't fight me on it. And it was something that I could have used from day one after signing it. But uh, they didn't fight me. In fact, they didn't re reply. I said, guys, I'm leaving. I'm, I'm using this clause here. I'm, I'm, I'm done. Thank you so much. And every reply to that, I, I got a reply from them like a year or so later on like social media when they like promote it. They, they like retweet one of my cartoons. And this is a former <laughs> guy for us, Clay Jones. He's awesome. So I was like, oh, that's cool. We're, we're still friends. But um, I, I thought I need to make a living at this and uh, I can do it by self-syndicating maybe. And I have. Uh, it, it changes every day, self-syndication. Uh, when I first started, it was, it was a lot easier to get clients, to get newspapers to sign up. Now, now it's so hard. It's so difficult because newspapers are controlled by one entity. It, they don't let their, like their chains, like a Gannett owns a newspaper and they don't let the, the local editors pick their stuff anymore. Mm -hmm. um, especially after one syndicate makes a sweetheart deal with them that says you only subscribe to us and they don't hire anybody else, you know, don't put anybody else in USA Today. And then they lock you out um uh, I, I have and but when i first syndicated uh you talk about what the experience was like i didn't even have internet at my my apartment at that time not this apartment it was a different <laughs> one um so were you doing just mailing it to everybody or no no it, well, it was email but what i did uh was i went to mcdonald's every day and oh. i used their wi-fi i'd sit there for like eight hours or something and, and i went through every single newspaper in the country to their websites and found the contacts. And if I couldn't find the contacts, I found a way to find the contacts. It was um, it, it was <laughs> so tedious. It was such hard work. And that today, every time, so now, well, I, I email every newspaper in the country when I do my drives to pick them up. And um, whenever they they bounce back, like um, like the news, like the editor has quit or he's died or he's been fired, usually they've been laid off. Uh, yeah. I go back to that site. And this is tedious too. And I update that contact list. Um, yeah. It's a pain in the ass. I hate it. it. It's so annoying. And I only do it a couple of times a year. And, but that's how I maintain the contact list. I, I probably have the email address for an editor at every newspaper in the country on me. I, I bet like telemarketers wow. will this list that I have. I could probably sell it. Uh, I won't do that though. But uh, <laughs> that's part of it. You can't just be a cartoonist when you're self-syndicate. And Joe Heller knows a lot more about this than I do because he's been doing it since the 1980s. Yeah. <clears throat> but um, and, and he's better at it too because his cartoons are more in line with what newspapers want. Uh, Joe draws really good cartoons, but he also draws a lot of softer issues. He'll tell you this. I'm not trying to insult him. And my cartoons don't really do that so much. My cartoons are mean and nasty and, and yeah. they're very political. And I've literally had editors tell me that we can't carry any cartoons on Trump. Not just stuff that criticizes him. They, they don't even want stuff that, that that likes him because the readers, they don't want to make any readers mad at all. You know? Uh, yeah. So it's a harder marketplace to draw for. Most newspapers won't really saw uh, cartoons that hit you about as hard as little kitty cat paws. You know? It's just like yeah. they don't really want a lot of stuff that's tough. Um, yeah. I'm not trying to say like I'm, I'm the toughest cartoonist out there and stuff like that, but but I know that that I am a tough cartoonist that that I do have some yeah. mean cartoons. I mean, look at the way I draw Donald Trump. So, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but it, it's a harder marketplace to, to syndicate. And plus, you're competing against packages. Like I, I can sell my cartoons and they just get me. But um, and some of my clients only use me. Uh, but others use several cartoonists. But but they can subscribe to any other syndicates and get like access to 20 cartoonists or more whereas me it's just me so so if they want me they really have to want me you know yeah. and that's flattering but uh that's all i'm selling so yeah so it's cool but it, but it's tough to compete against yeah 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 but it's it seems like you're doing okay and stuff you know i mean i'm getting by i mean i live in a studio apartment my god look behind me <laughs> so, oh, okay. i just see that cool guitar I, you know <laughs> yeah i bought all those back when i had a job <laughs> 20 oh, okay, years ago yeah. yeah. We don't buy guitars anymore so here. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. So, oh, okay. Well, I'm curious. In, in, in your website, you said, my cartoons do not tell readers what they should believe. I hope they simply challenge people to think. 
you, you kind of alluded to this, but, you know, you were saying like how, you know, we sent, we t you know, most cartoonists nowadays tend to preach to the choir and stuff. Yeah. But do you find it challenging for your cartoons, to, you know, to challenge people to think when they're preaching to the choir? Or do you still think that, um, you know, you're a liberal cartoonist, but you're still challenging a liberal readership about, you know, like, you know, just because you're a liberal, you can still be corrupt. And we got to we got to call yeah. ourselves out sometimes. Yeah, um, I wrote that, I think, with part of my stuff. Um, I think I wrote that when I first joined Creators in 2000. Oh, and, okay. Uh, okay. Like, I need a little bio, so I put that in there, but I, but I clung to it, and, and, I, and I've still kept it with me. And I still believe in that, but I don't know if we do it as much anymore. I like to challenge people. I think I do challenge people on the other side a lot, and most of the reaction is just to scream some Trump lies at you or some Fox News talking points. And you are challenging them, but as the what's the, the old adage, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them think, you know, yeah. and, and it's tough to do that. And I, I know that like last week when I criticized Lloyd Austin, uh, the first liberal response to me was like, how dare you make fun of his cancer? I wasn't make fun, making fun of his cancer. I was making fun of his his failure to inform, to to live up to his job. I'm criticizing him. If it was a, a Republican that did that and I did the same kind of cartoon, these same readers would be like, yes, you nailed that guy, you know? Yeah, but yeah. since he's a Democrat, they're like, yeah, I don't know, you should do that to him, you know? But yeah. but that's where you have to be responsible. Um, people on Go Comics, my, like my four haters over there this every day, they're like, this is the first time you criticize a Democrat. That's not true. But they always, and they'll say that next time I criticize a Democrat. It's the first time. Yeah. But liberals didn't like it when I criticized Austin and some of them even put in in comments. I saw a couple on Facebook. One guy wrote, "Well, Austin asked for clearance, and he well he asked for some time off, and they granted it to him." And that's not true, you know. Uh, and that came off to me as much of a lie as whenever a, a Trumper lies. It's like, where do you get this? Did you just yeah. pull it out of your butt? You know, well, I'm watching my language again. But yeah, just, I, I think it's the sometimes ideological. Sometimes they're just as bad. Sometimes yeah. they, liberals can be just as bad as Trumpers when it comes to defending their side. Yeah. And this is, again, why I don't want to be a Democrat. I don't want to have to be in a position of defending, sorry, assholes. I don't want to, and I'm not saying he is, but I don't want to have to defend other people's screw-ups and stuff like that. Yeah. Um it's not, That's part of the, part, the, the hyper-partisanship that you, you're, you're pushing against. Yeah, I, okay. and like my ninety percent of the time, I'm like hitting Republicans. I am, you know, I, I make no excuses for that. I feel like that's who needs to be hit. But when I do hit the Democrat, you know, people need to just deal with it. I guess or people need to be honest. That that's the thing. And like like those comments, those defenses of Austin, I didn't hear any that were honest. You know, mm -hmm. it's like when I hear somebody defend Trump, I don't hear honest defenses of him. And when Democrats mess up. Uh, but the only time that I see Democrats saying, yeah, let them go was like people with, like Menendez. And yeah. that's, a, yeah. And sometimes when people defend Hunter Biden or something, it's the wrong defense. There, there's something to defend there, but you can't defend um, him as a father. You know, you can't defend his lifestyle. You know, um, you, you can defend some of his taxes and stuff. You can, you can defend all the lies about his foreign work, but it, it's, to me, it's not somebody that, that you defend 100% because you're partisan, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think part of the partisanship is that you become, um, I think it's, okay, correct me if I'm wrong, okay? Uh, it, it, from what I'm hearing from you, the, the criticism against partisanship is that you, you let the other, you, you let your side get away with things that you won't let the other side get right, away with. Right, right. And that it's, it's just as important, you know, um, it's just as important we're all, you know, he, because of human nature, we're all we're all vulnerable to be corrupted by power, and it's your job to 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 act as a check on that that vulnerability, no matter who you are. Well, here's a great example. Uh, but one of my rules, personal rules, and I always I, I have certain cartooning rules, and and I, and I reserve the right to break them sometimes. But uh, <laughs> one of those rules is that. If I criticize a Republican for something, then I need to criticize when a Democrat does the same thing. And yeah. sorry for the sunlight coming in. I got posts right here. But um, so yeah. look at Trump's I golf. That's a great example. <laughs> I know. I, I have this black screen and there's a couple of holes in it because it's so old. <laughs> and then Trump said at this time of day, 
the sun comes right up my my drawing table. Uh -huh. But anyway, Trump golf is a great example. You saw every conservative, every Republican cartoonist in the country criticize Obama for his golf trips. And then Trump didn't just play more golf than Obama. He lied about it. He said, I won't have time for golf in this first 100 days. He played golf 19 times. He spent over 300 days of his four years in office playing golf. And I never saw one conservative cartoonist criticize him for his golf playing. Not one. I'm not. Yeah. That's not hyperbole. I, I didn't see any. But all those same goons that drew about Obama playing golf, who wasn't breaking any law, who wasn't grifting the public with it, they 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 went after him for that. But but meanwhile, Trump plays golf. But he doesn't just play golf. He finds a way to grift the American taxpayers for. It. He charges us for him to play golf. He charges yeah, a secret yeah. service golf cart rentals. He doesn't feed them for free at his resorts. And re Republicans, it's like Jared Kushner getting $2 billion from the studies, but Hunter Biden somehow is corrupt, who's never worked in government. And that's where the partisanship comes in. If I'm going to criticize one side for something, I would criticize the other for it. Uh, and I don't want to let Democrats escape on something that I'm going to criticize a Republican for. And no, I think no, that's, that's being a good editorial cartoonist. I think so. I, yeah. You know, I hope so. Yeah. So, and, and I'm sure that everybody's going to fail. I'm sure I'm going to fail somewhere along the way, but it's something that I keep in mind and I'm going to try for it. I'm not perfect. I'm not saying everybody be like me. I'm sure I, you know, I, I will overlook something, but I, I, did, I can't make a commitment to just like criticizing one side. Yeah, no, 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 no. That's, that's important and stuff. You know, I, I think we all should be, if you're, if you're to the left, you should still be willing to criticize the left. If you're to the yeah. right, and if you're if you're a good cartoonist, you should be still willing to criticize the right and stuff. You know, I think independence of mind is important and stuff. You know, you you know if there's corruption, no matter where it is, you should be able to criticize it. Definitely, that's the one yeah. thing that Hawaii taught me. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I mean, the Democrats, a lot of Democrats there were corrupt uh, in the whole system. Yeah, and you can't just say, "Oh, I'm liberal. I can't hit those guys." I mean, but then again, in places like that, locally, Democrats fight Democrats. You know, same thing as in Mississippi. Um, yeah. So, ask another cartoon question. Oh yeah, sure, sure. I, I, it's just, I'm almost done, actually. You know, oh, okay. um, you know. I, I guess this this will be just my last question and stuff. Um, you know, what do you love about editorial cartooning, and why are editorial cartoons important? That's a tough one. Why do I love it? Well, first off, I get to make fun of people. That's what okay. I did when I was in school. I used to get sent to the principal's office for doing this kind of stuff, and now I get paid for it. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, I, I like being a, holding people accountable, holding power accountable. I like punching up. Uh, I don't like punching down. Um, and I feel like I, I try to protect the people who are down. Um, this is a good analogy. When at my very first convention, I met Dick Loker, a wonderful guy. And he yeah. told me uh, our job was to watch the battle. And when the battle's over, we go down and we shoot the wounded. And I thought, yeah, that's awesome. But then later I, I, I reconsidered it. I thought, no, that's horrible. That's not what we do. We, we, yeah. uh, we, we do watch the battle. We, we're not supposed to take part in it. But after the battle, we don't shoot the losers. We don't shoot the wounded. We go after the winners. You know, the winners are the ones who rewrite history. We need to question the winners. We need to question their version of history. Yeah. Um, and that's what I like about being a cartoonist. Plus, I like satire. I love history. I love making fun of people. Uh, I like to make fun of powerful people. Like I was talking about, I don't, I don't want, like when I worked for the Costa Rica paper that was being run by goons, um, they, they had this, this issue once with, with uh, uh, refugees coming in from Nicaragua. And they said, and my editor, who, who was a goon, proposed, and a Trumper proposed that I did a cartoon making fun of them. And I said, I'm not going to do that for you yeah. at all. And, and then he knew me enough, well enough to that point to say, well, I had to try. And I'm like, how about you not try? <laughs> Stuff like that. But, um, yeah. And the, what was the second part of that question? Yeah. And why are editorial cartoons important? Uh, uh, just for that reason, I, I think. I think we have to make fun of ourselves. We have to laugh at ourselves. It's like people... Uh, like like we talk about, you know, Democrats, we can't make fun of Democrats or Democrats or Republicans can't make fun of themselves. Well, that's why we're here. We should be here to make fun of them. We should make fun of everybody. Uh, but but at the same time, uh, we put the message in there that maybe not persuade people, but to make them think. And for me, I think, well, my not what I think, I know my favorite weapon in that is humor is is, is to be funny. And that's the most 
important thing to me with each cartoon is how can I use humor? How can I be really, really weird with this? That's the other thing I love about cartooning. I get to be weird. Um, and I'm not, <laughs> weird. I'm not as weird as I want to be yet. I'm, I'm still trying for that. Yeah. And um, so I, I, I want to draw cartoons that nobody else can think of because they're so flipping weird, you know? So, yeah. and, and I think sometimes a couple of days a week, I might do that, but I might succeed in doing that. But yeah. um that's, well, that's you're what a I'll great look. cartoonist, and you offer oh. really cool perspectives and stuff. So you know, I, I mean, that's cool, part cool. of the reason I'm talking to you and stuff is to, <laughs> to learn more about you and stuff. So, well, I'm flattered that you you invited me to do this. So thank you. Oh yeah, sure. Thank you very much and stuff. So you're a good cartoonist too. <laughs> I, I hope so. <laughs> Not all the time. I think my problem is consistency and stuff. So I I, I was always a weekly cartoonist, and so maybe half mm -hmm. of my cartoons I thought were okay, and the other half was like, oh, I wish I could have redone that cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> that's not you. That's everybody. That's all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, it's contest time. It's the time of the year where, you, where I have to go through all of last year's cartoons. And, and here's a funny thing. like I drew over like 365 cartoons last year, and yeah. I go through all of those and say I need 15 for a contest, and I might pick 40 or 50 to choose from. So Think about that. Even if I go with 50, the bulk of my cartoons are not cartoon. I don't even find them cartoon worthy. Yeah. And uh, and as I go through it, um, I run into so many cartoons. Some of them, I actually go, what was this about? What was I talking about here? I don't get it. And, yeah. But I got it that day that I drew it. Readers got it. But uh, but they're so timely or, or just in the moment that, that the relevancy does not last. But I also, like you were talking about, I come across so many where I'm just like, eh, I could have done it so much better. Oh, I put my name on that? God, yeah, that's yeah. horrible. I hope nobody saw it. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. And it's a culture for CNN. You know, I hope nobody saw that one. It looks like total crud. Yeah. Um, so that's not you, buddy. That's all of us. Uh, if there's a cartoonist that doesn't go through, like, cartoons from over the past year or past few months and, and, and but he looks at them and says oh these are all perfect i'm awesome i'm the best cartoonist in the world that guy's an asshole and he's a liar because i <laughs> guarantee you i think mike luckovich and matt davies nick anderson uh these are some of the best cartoonists in the country right now yeah. and whether they're, they're among the best and i and i guarantee you each of those guys looks at their work and, and they find cartoons that they wish they could redo um yeah. so i know i do so I, I, I'm my biggest critic and I'm just like your, your biggest critic. Oh, okay. Well, thank you very much. And stuff. Yeah.